Welcome to Radio 815, a podcast dedicated to examining the work and the career of Ready Director J.J. Abrams. I'm your host. My name is Marcelo Nostroza, joined as always by my fellow co-host, Matt Crandall. And on today's edition, we're going to continue making our way through Lost Season 1. And today we're going to take a closer look at episodes 6 through 8. So with that, Matt, what did you think of uh, episode 6, House of the Rising Sun? Yeah, so House of the Rising Sun, um, basically a sun, sun-centric sun episode. You know, Jin is obviously in her flashbacks as well as we get to know more about them. Um, but I like this one because up to this point, Sun and Jin have kind of been enigmas like we didn't really know much about them they haven't we haven't seen either of them understand or speak any english for the most part in these first batch so this one where we find out that sun actually does know english um is a surprise and a nice moment and i like the the dynamic between sun and michael and the sort of you know, Jin getting mad at Michael and them having a fight because of this watch um, and what that means. Plus, we also get some interesting, like, adventure-style moments in the jungle with Charlie and the Beehive um, as Jack, Kate, and Locke, you know, further explore the island and the area around the freshwater caves. Um, so I thought there was lots of stuff going on here on the island and in the flashbacks that just helped us understand more of the character backgrounds while still having some of the action to drive the story. I really like this episode because like you said, it gave us a better look at Sun and Jin. But one thing that I particularly liked is in all the flashbacks of Sun meeting Jin, they speak in Korean naturally. And at the mm. time, it was very rare for a American uh, television channel to have two non-Americans, for lack of a better word, don't shoot me, speaking, you know, a, a language that wasn't English. So I really um, thought that was a bold choice by the writers and the producers of the show who let it go forward because the producers could have said you know, just have them speak just have them speak English. Why are we gonna have them speak Korean? But on that same note, if you notice every time that Jin and Sun are with Jack or Kate, whatever, every time they speak Korean, it's not subtitled. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like we're the only ones on the inside to what Sun and Jin are actually saying to each other and what they're communicating to each other. Right. I think, and that's partly because sometimes when they're talking, it's not important for us to know what exactly they're saying. But I did like that, you know, some of the stuff is subtitled and some is not. Um, I really like that we sort of see in the flashbacks that this is not necessarily a happy couple and sort of the, the steps of how they start as a happy couple. And then we get small information in the flashbacks where, you know, Jin is allowed to marry Sun, but he has to go and work for her father. Then we we jump ahead and we see, you know, the the puppy moment, but also that moment where Jin has blood on him, and it's like, what is happening here? And it gets so bad, and we still don't know the exact, you know, what has gone on, that Sun has taken those English lessons and is going to leave. Um by jumping in a a car at 11.15 from the airport and disappearing, leaving her husband high and dry. And we still have to, to sort of piece together, you know, what changed that she doesn't go through with it, that she ends up getting on the plane, and what brought them to that point. So it adds that intrigue and mystery to their two characters that they, wasn't necessarily there before. Before this episode, you know, they were just sort of the foreigners that we didn't know much about. But now, even though we know more about them, there's still so much mystery in their relationship and their dynamic 
that I find that interesting. And we see that Jin is quick to anger and jealousy with him lashing out at Michael because Michael and son have had a few interactions and because of the watch, um, which, you know, we still, it's going to take a lot longer for us to get the full picture of everything, but it does say a lot about Jin that, you know, he's not kind of like a level headed guy who would just kind of go and try and explain to Michael, like, Hey, that's not yours. I need it back. He's the kind of guy who would just tackle a dude and start beating him up um, when he's angry. So I thought that was interesting as well. I think that because of what Jin eventually has to do to earn the good, to earn the good graces of son's father, that sort of made him into the, the man that we see today. And as the show goes along, we see him sort of revert and come become a better person, uh, so to speak. I really liked the B plot between uh, Locke, Kate, Charlie, and Jack with them finding the caves. When Jack gets the bright idea to actually start moving people from the beach to the caves, that sort of that sort of goes against what he said a couple episodes ago, where he said. You know, if we don't learn to live together, we're going to die alone. So I don't know whether Jack wants to admit defeat at this point or whether he is finally seeing the picture and is understanding that they're going to be there much longer than they thought. What do you think about that, Matt? I don't think it's either, to be honest with you. I just think he's thinking practically to be close to the fresh water so that they don't exert themselves uh, makes more sense. And because like, he thinks everyone should move there. So he's surprised when people are saying like, we're going to stay on the beach. He's saying, no, like it's not worth it. Obviously Jack also has more information now where they find the two bodies at the caves, um, the man and the woman and the white and black stones. Um, so he knows that, you know, other people have been here before, they haven't been rescued since he does know they were so far off course. He, he doesn't think rescue is imminent. And he also, I think, has a feeling that if someone were to come to the island, it's not going to be like a boat passing that if they don't signal in that one instant, then they're going to be screwed. So he thinks like this makes better sense to set up a home here where we can live sustainably, comfortably rather than on this sandy beach where we have to worry about so much other stuff. So he's kind of surprised that like some of the people don't think it's a good idea, but also he, because he thinks it's such a good idea, he's not going to give in to the group mentality because basically he's kind of thinking like, well, you idiots do what you want then, I guess. But they kind of elected him their leader anyway. So wouldn't he think, that they would sort of follow him like sheep at this point, or at least some of them would follow him like sheep at this point, or am I just thinking way too much into this? Well, he has shown himself to be a leader, but I don't think it's anything that he, it's not a position that he necessarily wanted or takes pride in being. So I don't think that he would, I personally don't think he would think like, well, you guys have to do this because I'm the leader now. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I also I like I understand why people wouldn't want to follow his plan. And I don't think he's surprised they don't want to follow him. He's more surprised that they don't see the value in what he's offering them. The last thing that I really enjoyed about this episode is that this episode does a does a sneakily job of planting the seeds uh, of Charlie's issue. Let's call it. I, I love the scenes in this episode between Charlie and Locke where Locke is obviously on to what Charlie really wants and he keeps following him in the woods and around the caves. It gets to such an extent of, of uh, Locke following Charlie where he goes, get away from me, you git. Right? Uh-huh. I, just, I, I just love that line. There are so many good uh, one-liners in this episode from Charlie. Mm-hmm. No, I like I like the Charlie and Locke stuff a lot. Um, the beehive is infuriating because 
they were so close to getting it covered up, but it, it was just the, you know, thing that had to happen for them to run into that particular section of the caves to find the bodies. But, uh, you know, when he's, he's like, it's an irrational fear. And they're like, well, stop being afraid. And he's like, it's irrational. Like, I can't. It's so frustrating that literally they had that suitcase right there. And then he cracks the thing and we get the gratuitous scene where <laughs> Fox and Evangeline both have to strip down. Um, but I, I did like that, you know, Locke can recognize the signs. So he knows that Charlie is sneaking away to try and get his fix. And I do think that we learn a lot about Charlie when, you know, Locke says to him, like, you're going to run out. It's going to be a problem. So maybe you should quit while you're ahead um, and just get ready for the the pain. And he said, you know, what is something you would want more than the drugs? And Charlie says, you know, well... Yeah, like I would, I love music more than I love the drugs. So like if I could have my guitar, that would be great. So I love that moment where he he does hand over the drugs by choice. And then Locke's just like, look up. <laughs> and and there's Charlie's guitar, um, which is a, a nice moment where, you know, I'm sure Charlie's kind of kicking himself. But at the same time, it does show that there were more important things to him than the drug so even though as we find out in the next episode that the drugs ruined his musical life music is still that that thing that has a strong connection to him let's move on to episode seven entitled the moth what do you think about that one so that is the charlie centric one and it's fun to see (laughs) now they give us lots of fun flashbacks with charlie before things get serious because, you know, we see Dry Shaft in their infancy and you all, everybody starting to to take off. And Charlie at confession for his, uh, you know, inappropriate relations with a woman. And then a minute later, relations with another woman and then inappropriate relations, watching them have relations like those Those things are like the rock star uh, stupid, funny things. So I like that, but the whole metamorphosis during the episode, the, you know, using the moth as this metaphor, um, works really well for, for Charlie, his detox and for having to step up and, you know, do more than people thought he was capable of in the case of the cave in and Jack being stuck and sort of only one person who will fit to get in there, and it being Charlie who is going through this horrible detox and and tough time, um, which speaks a lot to his character and his you know inner strength, even if he is attached to this chemical at the moment. Um, when push comes to shove, he can try and do what has to be done. I really connected with Charlie's plight in this episode because like Charlie, I've dealt with a lot of difficult demons throughout my life. And some of those demons I was able to excise and some of those demons I'm still dealing with today. So it was really a tour de force to see Charlie basically put his old demons to rest and rise up. And I love that metaphor of the cocoon that Locke said to Charlie in the in the forest. I I really, really love this episode because the performance by by uh, Derek Monaghan is so striking. It's so striking. It's so funny, and it's so awful uh, when you discover that the only reason that he's hooked on drugs is because his brother started it. To see his brother get clean, but then to see him walk away from his brother was really heartbreaking to me. Yeah, and that's one of those interesting dynamics where we do see that it was Liam who was the one who started experimenting with drugs and letting things get off the rails. And Charlie is fed up with it. But after he, you know, is sick and tired of having the same fight for the millionth time with his brother, his curiosity and his frustration get the better of him and he himself 
tries the drugs, tries the heroin or whatever it is, and uh, goes down this this terrible path. Flash forward to that last part of the flash flashbacks where we see him go and say to his brother, like, hey, man, drive shaft. We got like a comeback in the works. We can go on this awesome eight week tour. I just need you to say yes and come and do this. And the brother saying, look, I have gotten my life together. I have a daughter now. I'm upset that I missed her birth. And that was when I was on the junk and I realized that there are much more important things than just that chemical high. So I can't do this because if I get put in that environment, there's a good chance bad things are going to happen again. And him looking at Charlie and being able to recognize that Charlie is still hooked and Liam kind of knowing that it is a path that he chose that Charlie just followed him down. Um, those brothers have like a very interesting, tough relationship. And the point in the episode where we leave them is like a really tough moment for both of them because their paths have diverged. And even though Charlie wants them to come back together, it's kind of like a uh, pouring gasoline on a fire if it were to happen. And they, they can't really do that. As that scene played out, I kept, I kept saying to myself, all you have to do is turn around and hug him for God's sakes. If you do that, you'll you'll save yourself a modicum of pain later on. But I keep thinking, if he didn't if he didn't eventually get on the plane, he wouldn't have become the person that he became ultimately. Also, my favorite scene in that episode is when Charlie tries to confront Liam and tries to say to him, "Listen, we agreed. If it got too much for us, we're going to walk away." And then Liam says. What are you talking about? I am dry shaft. If 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 I if I leave or you know or or if you get somebody different to run the band, there is no dry shaft. Right. And the the interesting thing about that scene is that the first time we see Liam in the church and he tells Charlie about their record contract, he says to Charlie, "You are dry shaft. I'm just a pretty boy singing the songs." So, mm-hmm. I thought that that parable or or the or the or the uh, parable that the writers put in there was a great parable to 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 show the toxicity that the drugs had on Liam. Yeah, and I also don't think the name Liam is a coincidence because two of the most famous coked out feuding brothers in rock and roll are Liam and Noel Gallagher of Oasis and I think that Charlie and Liam's relationship in this is definitely kind of based on that actual uh, brother duo who, you know, started a band together and now haven't spoken to each other in 15 years. Um, The other thing with the title being the moth and with Locke explaining about the cocoon to Charlie, um, it's, it's all the themes and it is kind of like the most basic way that they literally like laid them out in the episode where he says like, you know, we could get the, the moth out of this cocoon, but the struggle is what gives it its strength. Um, so it's, you know, not very subtle, but that moment where Charlie has to choose strength and, and struggle by getting rid of the drugs, getting into the cave, helping Jack out, and when he throws the drugs into the fire, it's him consciously saying, like, you know, he realizes this is going to be a battle, but it will make him stronger in the end. We have made it to episode eight, Confidence Man. So this is actually one of my favorite episodes probably of season one. Um, I'm not going to declare it like my favorite, but, you know, certainly top top tier um partly because i always have found sawyer to be a very interesting character because he's such a dick (laughs) that you're like man like why is this guy such a dick and in this you know people jump to conclusions about him right away thinking that he has shannon's inhaler because of basically hearsay you know they happen to see him reading a book that was with her luggage 
he won't give them the inhalers, so they end up torturing the shit out of him. Um, he almost dies because Saeed stabs him. Like, it's a rough episode for him. But also, in the flashbacks, I, I really like that the flashbacks take a surprising turn um, where we do see Sawyer as the con man running his game and every flashback is about how invested he is in the con, how easy this con is for him. He owes money. Don't worry about it. I got this con locked up. And then in the final flashback, when it comes to the exact moment where he's about to succeed in the con, that kid walks in and he says, deals off. It's over. And he leaves and he leaves his briefcase and their briefcase. Like he just walks out, washes his hands of it. And it's like, okay, what, what happened? Um, and the reveal that that letter that he carries was not written to him, but written by him is one of those great, like you didn't see it coming moments, um, adds so much depth to his character that yes, he is a dick and a bad guy, but it's because he was hurt so badly as a child and couldn't wrap his head around how that could happen to his family that then it's like life's cruelest irony that that has become his life now. So I thought it just the way everything comes together with the flashbacks and the modern times with in respect to Sawyer, who is a character who up to this point has just been jackass number one. Um, it makes you like and respect the guy's journey and the character. There's a lot more going on than we initially thought. And that is a nice surprise. To add on to your point, the character of Sawyer up to this point has been a class a-hole racist jerk. So, yeah, racist, sexist, perv, <laughs> like everything. Yeah, I, I really found it interesting that Sawyer would take this dire situation with giving... Uh, Jack, the inhaler medicine to to save to basically save Shannon. I really found it interesting that he would use this situation to sort of torture himself as a way for him to atone for everything that he's done. Because if it wasn't for if it wasn't for Sawyer's childhood, who knows? He could have become uh, spoiler here. He could have become a cop. He right. could he could have become anything else except for a con man. So I really really thought that the scenes with Sawyer refusing to give Jack the medicine to save Shannon were wonderfully done. And my favorite scene of the episode is when, Bab when uh, Saeed sticks the bamboo sticks under Sawyer's nails. That, that scene to me is horrifying. Yeah. But, and you know, if you guys have been listening to the podcast for a while, you guys know that I love a good torture scene. So I'm sure, Matt, in the back of your head when you saw this on the screen, you're like, Marcelo's going to like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I, um, I, I really enjoyed this episode. I, I, thought, I thought it was a whole lot of fun. Yeah, and it's, it's like that nice balance of fun, and then it hits you with some of the serious stuff, which makes it stand out. And this one was written by Damon, so, like, you know, he knows what's up. He knows how to do things in a way that subverts your expectations. And even when, you know, we think like, oh, what a creep. When Sawyer's like, yeah, I'll give you the the inhalers for a kiss. Um, but then it is kind of actually like a tender moment and uh, like unexpected. You're like, okay. And then when he says like, yeah, I don't have them. <laughs> you're like, oh my gosh, you son of a bitch. But uh it's it's him playing into that, like, if everybody thinks I did this, then I might as well have just done it. So, you know, he's not going to deny it for longer than he has to because he knows they won't believe his denials. So when everybody assumes that he has the inhalers, he just goes along with it because, you know, if you think I'm a dirtbag, then I'm going to play up being the dirtbag because that's how you see me, which is something that, you know, Sawyer has done in his life as like a defensive mechanism so that people don't get close and see who he actually could be or actually is. Um, he'd rather just let their assumptions be correct. And that's going to be part of the, the interesting journey 
as we get to know him and the other characters. And this does show that Saeed, you know, in his military background, has had some Jack Bauer-esque experience uh, when it comes to information extraction, let's, let's say. And that adds another layer to him that we... Obviously, we haven't seen much of Saeed's backstory yet, so that's that's still more to, to play on. But all of the stuff on the island, and, you know, Shannon and Boone get a few extra moments because of this asthma thing, and Sun comes to the rescue with the recipe for the eucalyptus whatever, basically Vicks VapoRub or something that helps save the day. So we see a lot of the supporting characters you know, a bit more emotional depth to them, even though they're not the star of the episode. A little bit of Sun's ingenuity and knowledge comes into play. And I liked that, you know, this everyday normal health thing that we don't think twice about when you're stranded on an island, instantly asthma that, you know, oh, somebody has asthma, oh, who cares, uh, could become a death sentence in the blink of an eye, which again raises the stakes and and makes us a little bit more wary of the the perils of living on an island that we might not have thought about before this episode. The thing that I find interesting uh, when Sun actually brings that eucalyptus to, to Shannon and she's applying it to Shannon's uh, chest, basically, in the background you see Jin uh, 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 hoisting up bamboo sticks. And I'm like, as I was watching this, what did, I'm like, what in the world... Is he doing with those bamboo sticks? Mm -hmm. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, I know what he's going to do with those bamboo sticks. Uh, that wraps it up for this episode of Radio 815. Uh, Matt, what's the best place that uh, the good folks can uh, get at you and talk to you about loss and other things? Yeah, at Matt Crandall on Twitter is the easiest spot to grab my attention. If you guys want to talk to me, also the best spot to reach me is... On Twitter, I'm at CreekFanatic88. But until next time, thank you so much for listening. But as always, we'll talk back soon.